I am the Khan Academy SAT coach, test prep master um, tutor, and I'm here to help you for the next 45 minutes to an hour um, go over some last minute tips and strategies that are really helpful, should be really helpful to help you, you know, gain confidence and raise your scores on Saturday. And if you're not taking the test on Saturday, uh, whenever you take the test. And so I'm going to highlight a number of things today. The things that I think are the most, you know, the biggest game changers for different uh, areas of the test. Um, so today we're going to go over last minute tips, strategies for test day. Um, we're going to go over a technique called plugging in for the math test. We're going to go over um, active reading on the reading test, uh, the importance of rephrasing and predicting on the reading test. And we're also going to talk about uh, some writing and language uh, test item, items, really just about punctuation is all the time we'll have um, everything we'll have time for. And then we're going to go over uh, the essay prompt and ways in which the essay prompt can, um, can help you improve your, uh, improve the accuracy of your response and do what the, what the SAT wants you to do. Uh, here we go. We're going to talk about um, math test, top strategy, plugging in. We're going to go over um, one, two, three, plugging in one, two, and three on some algebra questions that are really tricky. We have testing values, which can help you um, understand an algebra question that you might have more trouble um, conceptualizing. And we're also going to look at a problem that is uh, plugging the point into the equation. Um, let's go to the next thing. So here's an example of a problem in which plugging in numbers can help you understand, make sense of what's going on in a problem. So let's get started. To edit a manuscript, Miguel is charging $50 for the first two hours and $20 per hour for after the first two hours. Which of the following expresses the amount in dollars C Miguel charges if it takes him X hours to edit a manuscript where X is greater than two? Okay, so the, the proper way to do this in math class and algebra is to understand that you, he's first charging the $50, and then he is gonna charge $20 for every hour after the first two, which means that you need to write X minus two in there. You may not realize that, um, and that may be something that's challenging for you. If you look at an algebra question and you think, I just can't understand what's going on here, you could try plugging in. How would that look? Well, in this case, we're not going to plug in one. I'm not going to plug in two because X has got to be greater than two. So we're going to try plugging in three and seeing what happens. So what does that mean? Um, if I'm plugging in two, if I'm plugging in three, I'm going to write down X equals three. And then I'm going to say, okay, what is X? X is the number of hours it takes to add him a manuscript. So if he has three hours, if he's charging for three hours, he's going to charge $50 for that first hour and then in the second hour and then that third hour he's going to charge 20 bucks. So we have a grand total of 70. So this 70 is something that's kind of what needs to come out when X is three. Um, and so what you can do is you can take that three and plug it into our choices. So let's look at A. So A we have 20 times 3. B, we have 20 times 3 plus 10. That looks good. C, we have 20 times 3 plus 50. D, we have 20 times 3 plus 90. Our answer is B. Okay, and as you see, it also matches up with what we did here. If you had, you know, that's the correct way to conceptualize this, this, uh, this problem. This will come out to be 50 plus 20x minus 40 because you distribute here and here. And that's going to give you 20x plus 10. Okay, so you can double check it that way. Both ways we have B. But plugging in can be super helpful as you've just seen. So let's do a couple more. Um, a voter registration drive was held in town Y. The number of voters V registered T days after the drive began can be estimated by the equation V equals 3,450 plus 65 T. The question is, what is the best interpretation of the number 65 in this equation? Best interpretation of some component 
of an equation. This is a type of question that you're likely to see on, on Saturday. Um, if the answer doesn't just jump out at you, you can start thinking about what it would mean to plug in different numbers and see what happens. Right, so if, if we're plugging in one for t, one day after the drive began, we'd have v is 3, 4, 50 plus 65 times one. And if t is two, this is t equals one, this is t equals two, this is t equals three, we're gonna do that. Um, 30, 4, 50 plus 65 times two. And then the next one is gonna be 30, 4, 50 plus 65 times three. And so what's happening here? Look at the, start looking at the choices. Like what is, that, what is that number doing? What is this number 65 doing? Um, we look at the choices. It, it seems to be increasing each day. The number, the total number increases by 65, right? The first one we have, you know, 165. Then we have two 65s. Then we have three 65s. Um, what's happening here? Well, if we look at the choices, we have the number of registered voters, A, we have the number of registered voters at the beginning of the registration bus. So no, 60, there weren't 65 at the beginning. It seems like 3450 is the number at the beginning. Let's cross that all the way out. B, the number of registered voters at the end of the registration drive. Was that 65? No, let's cross that out. C, the, number, the total number of voters registered during the drive. Um, 65? No, okay, so our answer is D. And it makes sense. The number of voters registered each day during the drive. Each additional day, we have 65 more voters. So plugging in can help you make sense of questions like this as well. Okay, so let's move on to another one. This one's a little more tricky. Uh, it's about exponential growth, uh, which is a more advanced concept. But you'll find that plugging in numbers can help here as well. And when do we know when to use plugging in numbers? Often it's with algebra questions that you can't really make sense of. <laughs> so when you're trying to like figure out what to do next, when you, you don't know what you're looking at with equations like this, um, let's read it first, okay? So a biology class at Central High School predicted that the local population of animals will double in size every 12 years. The population at the beginning of 2014 was estimated to be 50 animals. Let's see, so 2014 is 50 animals. If P represents the population N, N years after 2014, then which of the following equations represents the class's model of the population over time? Model of the population, kind of scary. Um, if you don't, if you can't look at these choices and say like, oh, that makes sense, it's gotta be blah de blah, then what can you do? You can say to yourself, okay, what's happening here? Let's see what happens. It's doubling in size or doubling in size every 12 years. So in 2014, it's 50 animals, so When's it going to be? The one's going to double. It's going to double 12 years from now. So, so we could say that that's you know 2026, 20, but that's when n is 12. So when n is 12, then we should have a result that is 100, right? So I'm going to plug in n equals 12 and see whether you know see whether any of these things match. So I take 12 and I plug it into the choices. 12 plus 50 times 12, it's not 100. 50 plus 12 times 12, that's not 100. This one, we got 50 times 2 to the 12 n power. That's, we could look at that. It doesn't look like it'll be 100, but these are kind of confusing. So you may as well, let's just see what happens. We work it out. We have 50 times 2 to the 12 times 12. I mean, it's definitely not. 2 to the 144th power. That's huge. That number is immense. No way it's 100. So we could just say, okay, it's D. But let's look at, let's look at this and say, well, let's just double check. 50 times 2 to the 12 over 12. 50 times 2 to the 1. 
100. We have a winner. Okay, so we proved it to ourselves just by plugging in. Again, plugging in, really powerful strategy. Um, try it. Okay, one more. I, I can't overemphasize like how how helpful this strategy can be. Um, we can plug in numbers here. If the object of mass m is moving at speed v, the object's kinetic energy ke is given by the equation here. If the mass of the object is halved, halved mass is times a half, and the speed is doubled, how does the kinetic energy change? If you were just rushing through this test and you were being careful, you might say, okay, halved and doubled, well, that should just cancel it out. Maybe it's unchanged. Um, I wouldn't count on that kind of reasoning to answer the, you know, answer the, the questions in the test. We're going to see in the reading section, it doesn't make sense to do that, to like read the question, look at the choices, choose the one that looks best. It's, it's really not the best way to, to work your way through the test. Okay, so here's, you know, what, we, I'll, first I'll do it the way that um, would make sense to do properly, okay, in, in the way that in terms of conceiving of this, we have a kinetic energy, we have a kinetic energy, you know, one, the first one as it starts is half times m1 v1 squared, okay, and then we're going to have a new kinetic energy, and m2 is going to be m1 divided by 2, so it's m2 is half of the original mass, right, and the speed is doubled, so v2 is 2 times v1, and then you can plug that all in um, and, uh, and figure it out. So, but my point is this, like this will definitely, well, let's just go ahead and do it. So let's see, one half, and then Ke2 is gonna be with M2, so that's M1 over two, and it's times V squared, which is two V1 squared. Um, and we see that it isn't just unchanged. But the, the point I wanna make here is that a special strategy is to plug in some stuff. So let's imagine that rather than dealing with all this M1, V1 things, I'm gonna plug in like the mass, the first mass, let's make mass one. Mass one is gonna be two. And V1 is gonna be three. And I'm just plugging in two and three. You could plug in other numbers. It doesn't matter. So let's see what happens. So our, our first kinetic energy is half times two times three squared. That's Ke1. And now Ke2 is going to be half. We're having, okay, we need to cut the mass in half. So this is gonna be times one. And our velocity is gonna be, let's see, V1 is gonna be doubled. So this is times six. And that gets squared, okay? So Ke1 was half times two times three squared, which is nine. And this is half times one times six squared. Um, so that's 18. Uh, so half times one times 36. So Ke2 equals 18. So our kinetic energy doubled because we went from nine to 18. Okay, another example of plugging in. Okay, one last plugging in example. Sometimes you're given an equation and then you're given points uh, that you could plug into that equation. Or, so let's read this. The function f is defined by this, where c is a constant. Or in the x, y plane, so c is some constant. In the x, y plane, the graph of f intersects the x-axis at three points. Here are the three points. What is the value of c? Well, you could try to do a lot of, you could try to find the zeros of this equation. 
Um, you could plug in the factors of this polynomial. Um, or it may be more straightforward for you to just choose one of these and plug it in. Choose one of these points. Let's start with that one and plug it in. This is the, you know, this is the point negative 4, 0, which means that this point uh, works with this equation. So let's see what happens. 2 times negative 4 cubed plus 3 times negative 4 squared plus c times negative 4 plus 8. Okay, and that came out to be 0. Okay, f of x, that's in this case, you could think of it as being y. The point negative 4, 0, when you plugged negative 4 into the equation, you came out and got 0. The value of the, the, value of the function is 0 there. So now we have to solve this. So negative 4 cubed is negative 64. 2 times negative, 60, oops, negative 64 plus 3 times 16 because negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16 plus c times negative 4. I can, you know, that's plus negative 4c. Let's just call, let's just say minus 4c. Um, plus 8 equals 0. Let's keep boiling it down. We have negative 128 plus 48 minus 4c plus 8 equals 0. And then um, negative 28, negative 128 plus 48 is negative 80. Um, minus 4c plus 8 equals 0. Um, we could, let's just move the 4c over there. Negative 80 plus 8 is negative 72 equals 4c. So we added 4c to both sides. To add 4c, I have to add 4c, so it just swung over. Then we divide by 4, divide by 4, and we get negative 18. Okay, that's our answer. So it's still a hard question, don't get me wrong. This is a, this is a challenging question, but plugging the point into the equation is another kind of plugging in that you can do on the test. Okay, so let's move on. We're going to move on. We're going to talk about, um, about reading and writing strategies. And I want to just bring you back to um, the SAT mission, mission slash SAT on Khan Academy, um, where you can find problems to practice. Um, I'll just move on. Okay, so this is a, um, a strategy that is highlighted in the tips and strategies section of Khan Academy official SAT practice. Um, and it is called, it is, it is a version of a famous <coughs> active reading strategy technique um, called SQ3R, and I've sort of adapted it for the SAT. Um, the S stands for survey, the Q stands for question, the R's stand for, there are three R's. First one is read, second one is recite, third one is review. And so let's see how that works. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna do an overview of this and then um, we'll move into uh, looking how it works on a passage. So, um, we're first going to survey. When you turn to a new, a new passage in the SAT, turn the page, there it is, bang. What do we do? If we follow this strategy, and there are other strategies, but this one works pretty well, um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to read the blurb for context. The blurb is a little small print at the top. It's going to tell you a little bit about what you're about to read. It's going to tell you the title. It's going to tell you the, the year that it was written. And we'll just sort of let that go. But you should skim it because it's going to start bubbling away in the back of your mind. Um, then I'm going to then skim. Is, this is part of the surveying, the scanning and skimming you're going to do. Um, if you just have a quick look at the first sentence of every paragraph, this is going to take you one minute. Don't take a lot of time with it because you are going to read the passage, believe it or not. Um, and then I'd like you to consider surveying the questions too. Um, in doing that, you're going to put little marks in them. Um, you're going to read and see what, you know, whether there are questions that mention paragraph three, whether there are questions that mention specific line numbers. And you're going to put like, you put brackets along the side of your passage. Um, and again, this is just a, a quick scan and skim. You're not trying to do these questions. You're not trying to remember these questions. 
You also can circle weird names of big words in the questions because if you have looked at them once, the chances are good that your brain will kind of like perk up when you read it, when you're finally reading the passage. And this should take not very long, just a minute or two. Not as much as two, probably close to a minute. Um, so the, um, the next thing you're gonna do is gonna do the question stage. And the question stage is just a really quick thing and it's all just about getting fired up. You're just gonna be like, okay, why do I care? Like, get excited. Maybe I'm not excited about this, but I'm gonna make myself excited because that way I'm gonna ask questions as I go. What's the point of this passage? These are the, you know, some questions you could ask yourself. Um, you don't have to answer it. You don't need to take too much time. But the idea is, what is this about? What do I hope to learn in this passage? Um, then you're gonna start reading actively. What does reading actively mean? It means underlining and circling claims, things that the, you know, the, the, the paragraph is saying, you know, this is a problem, and then you, that may be a claim, and then there'd be examples throughout the paragraph that, ex that support that claim. You're gonna underline and circle key words. The idea is just sort of do with your hand, you know, the gestures that you're making with your hand on the page, what you hope your brain is doing in terms of remembering what you're reading. You're reading actively. You should make quick notes. We have three different kinds of, you know, there are four different really useful quick notes you can make. There's the plus. If the author is supporting some idea, you could put a little plus in the, you know, in the margins. If, if there's, you know, something's being undermined, something's being criticized heavily, you can put a minus. If you, if there's, if the people that are being described have, are confused, you could put a question mark. If, if the people, you know, who are being mentioned are excited, there's this huge discovery, then you could make a little exclamation point. Those are just ways to engage with what you're reading. Um, other two points I want to make are circling the but and circling the and. Um, the but is basically contrast words, and you could probably thinking of them right now. We have, however, um, unfortunately, uh, there, there are tons of them. Um, in the and, uh, you know, nevertheless, even so, uh, in fact, is actually a contrast word. Um, you know, uh, then we have circling the ands, and that's therefores, and um, since, and so. Uh, those are all and words. Those are important to circle. The, the last thing I'll mention is the semicolon. Semicolons are helpful because they usually indicate that the sentence is gonna tell you the same thing in a slightly different way. Um, so if you don't understand the first time, maybe the second time will you know, be, it'll be more straightforward. So, that, so a semicolon is also a form of an and. Uh, okay, so that was the reading, that was active reading. And then as you go, I also want you uh, to consider after every paragraph saying, what was that about? What was the point? And you make a little note in the margin. Um, you use your own words to describe what you're reading and that kind of gives you control over what you're reading. So you don't find yourself reading the second paragraph and realizing you have no idea what the first paragraph was about. Um, it, it happens, especially with, you know, on test day to many people. Um, the more you're able to rephrase it as you go along after every paragraph and then finally the review part is after completing the passage, the more you'll uh, be set up to answer the questions correctly. Okay, the next big reading strategy I wanna talk about is just a follow on of this active reading. And that is two critical uh, things. Excuse me. One of them is rephrasing and one of them is predicting. Rephrasing is a way of getting control of a question. A lot of these questions just kind of peter out at the end and they don't actually have a question mark, is the reading section. Um, and I, what I want you to avoid at all costs is doing this. Don't read the questions, then the choices, and choose the one that sounds best. We talked about that earlier. It's not the best way to do with the SAT or any test. Um, what you should do is to rephrase if possible. We'll see what that means in a second. Um, that's using how, what, or why. Every question can't be rephrased um, using how, what, or why, but many of them can, and those that can, it's worth doing. 
Um, because it, what it does is it gives you control of the question and gives you a more pointed question to go back to the passage and, um, and read around and predict. So you're reading around any line references that are mentioned in the passage, in the question. You're reading around, and then you are going to predict. So rephrasing and predicting are the two things that you should be find yourself doing again and again uh, as you go. And the goal is to know what you want before you start looking, okay? If you know what you want before you start looking, you're not going to wind up looking at the choices one by one and trying to make sense of them, okay? Because that's just a recipe for losing a lot of time, Wait, you know, spending time giving the benefit of the doubt to questions, to answer choices that, that aren't right. And they, you, you find yourself trying to figure out how they could be right when you're much better served, you'll save more time if you go and you get your own answer, you trust yourself and get your own answer and then cross out the ones that don't match your answer because your answer is going to be based on evidence that you'll find in the passage because every question, there's only one right answer and that one right answer is an answer that is backed up by evidence. The others are wrong for whatever reason, but the right answer has evidence. Okay, here's some, uh, here's some examples of rephrasing. This is an exercise. I'm going to have some water. Why don't you guys read, read these for a second. I whipped these up earlier. <laughs> um, the author mentions the craft of cat hair felting. <clears throat> it's a real thing. Um, primarily in order to... So that question is sort of like, can I go back to the passage and like say, the author mentions the craft of craft, like you get tongue-tied even thinking about it or you know, talking about it. So if you can rephrase that and say, what, why is the cat hair felting there? Why, why, why? Right, in order to is sort of a why. That's something you can keep in your head. Why is the cat hair felting there? And you go and you answer that question in your own words. And then you come across other ones that don't match. Let's look at the next one. The author introduces the second paragraph with the word luckily in order to. I would rephrase this saying, what does luckily do? Why is it there? Why? What does it do? Do okay. What is the what is the function or purpose of the word luckily? Okay, go back. You answer that in your own words. Cross out the ones that don't match your answer. The description in the third paragraph indicates that what Kermit values most about Miss Piggy is her. Is her what? Okay, so you go back and you say, how do we phrase it? Like why? What does he value most about her? And you go back and you may discover that it's her strength. There's an example of her strength or or her loyalty. And, like, and, that'll, and you'd say like, oh, it's the loyalty. And you go and you cross out the ones that don't, the answer choices that don't include loyalty because there's evidence that tells you that the third paragraph, loyalty is key. Okay, so in the context of the passage, the author's use of the phrase jiggy with it is primarily meant to convey the idea of that. Okay, so you say to yourself like, it's not, it's not what does jiggy with it mean, it's why does the author use that phrase? And you go back, like why is it there? Is it because He's trying to be cool? <laughs> is it because he really loved Will Smith in the late 90s? Um, we, we don't know. But you go back, you find evidence. There's clearly some evidence about why the author has decided to use this word. Okay, and then you answer that question. You come back, cross out the answers that don't, the choices that don't match your answer. Okay, now we're going to have a quick look, quick, uh, quick look at another um, very common reading question. Um, it's a words and context question. As it is used in line nine, whatever, the word pander most nearly means dot, dot, dot. And there usually are, are answers that are synonyms or, or, or somehow remind you of this word. So indulge, is it flatter, is it accommodate, is it to pet a black and white bear? Um, probably not. Uh, but what you do, is you choose one of two plans. One is to um, cross out the word in the passage. Just go and find it, cross it out. And then you read around it. This is, we're gonna wrap it. Let's read around and predict. 
And then we're going to make up our own word instead. That's the prediction. We go back, we look back, we see that the, the word pander is used to mean um, to, to flatter and say what somebody, you know, somebody wants to hear. And then you go and you cross out the choices that don't match your word. Now the plan B, if you can't come up with your own word, is to cross out the word in the passage, same, and then you can just plug in the choices to see which one sounds best. Generally, pretty reliable um, way, and especially now on the, the, you know, the new format of the SAT, we don't have words that are super complicated that are, you know, the words like mendacious and uh, lacrim you know, lacrimal or whatever, words that, that, are, that are no longer in the SAT. Usually you can plug in these choices and have a sense of which one sounds best. Okay, so we are moving on. Um, where, uh, I'm not sure what I wanted to show in this one, but we'll move on. Ah, reading. It's time to practice and to demonstrate what this, uh, these strategies were. So, we talked about SQ3R. First thing we'll do is we will um, we'll read the blurb. Uh, the passage is adapted from Jan Delhi and Christian Kroll a happiness test for the new measures of national well-being. How much better than GDP are they? Okay. Um, it's about happiness and whether it's how it's related to GDP. That's interesting. I might not know what GDP is. I might learn that. Um, and uh, and I, it might have something to do with happiness or not. Um, so we're going to learn about that. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll have a quick look at, at the, uh, the first sentences of these paragraphs. Um, currently a broad global movement away from considerations, a global movement, that sounds big, away from considerations of mere economic success towards a new, so away from economics, away from that, um, towards a new public policy goal involving a broader notion of quality of life. Okay, quality of life, economics. Okay, let's scroll down a little bit. This movement has also spurred a rethinking. Okay, so we're going to read the, we're just skimming here, we're scanning. Three key strategies have been employed. We have healing, complementing, replacing. Uh, this one is about the first group of initiatives, one key aim of this group of measures. Okay, and then I'm gonna, that's a quick scan, and then I'm gonna scan these. I'm just gonna look at a couple of the questions in this set. Um, we have a reference to a guy named Simon Kuznets. Okay, that's a memorable name. Um, there's views in line eight. I'm going to find the word prominent, maybe circle it. And then I'm going to first group of initiatives. I can maybe look for this first group of initiatives, um, but we could also do that later. Um, I've already inter underlined that, but you know, there it is, first group of initiatives. One other thing that you could think about doing when you're scanning, if that's something that you find yourself doing because you're short on time on the reading section, is that you can, um, you can basically bring your finger down the center of this text. I'm not recommending this if, if you're not short on time, okay? If you're looking for, if, you're, if you feel like you're the, if you're the sort of test taker who runs out of time in the reading section and you need to pick up some points, you might find yourself looking for names like Simon Kuznets um, because you just don't have enough time to finish reading the passage. Um, what you can do is to, you know, bring your finger down the center of the, to the text and say, oh, there he is. Okay, um, similarly, I could be bringing my finger down the center of the text and I say, you know, first group of initiatives and I saw that as well. So that's just a, a, another sort of skimming strategy that, um, that you might need, that you could use um, if it helps. Um, okay. Let's check the time. Time is flying. Um, so let's just go and let's see, there's one other question down here, which is a best evidence question. Okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna spend time looking at these. Don't, don't look at these now, okay? Because your next step is to, is to read the passage. And as you're reading, um, you will, do this annotation that, that we've kind of I've kind of shown you some of that, um, but now let's let's imagine we've read it, um, and I just want to use the rip wrap, use the rephrasing and prediction strategy to answer some of these questions. In the first paragraph, the reference to Simon Kuznets 
mainly serves to, mainly serves to. So that is a, what does it do? You know, what is its purpose? Why is Simon Kuznets referenced? So we're going to read around it. Okay, so let's start maybe here. This is the most prominent yardstick the media, politicians, and the public consider when they try to assess how a country is performing. Um, however, this measure was meant, never meant to be a measure of the welfare of nations. Okay, so he warned. Simon Cousins is a guy, oops. Simon Cousins is a guy who warned about GDP being used as a measure of, uh, of the welfare of nations. It's, it's not meant to do that. So it serves to show that, so we're, again, we're sort of go back, going back to this question. Um, the reference is serving to show that it never was meant to be that way. Um, okay, so let's look at the choices. We predicted, that's a little bit of a prediction. What is the reference doing? It's, it's saying that he, it was never meant to be um, a measure of the welfare of nations. Let's look at the choices. Is it to emphasize, is it the reference to him to emphasize that the GDP is a respected and valid tool? That doesn't sound like what I was looking for. I'm gonna to skip to the next one. Underscore a common concern about the GDP. That, that sounds tempting. Um, by citing a critic. Critic. He, he, he was not a critic, he actually, he created it. Okay, so this, this makes that wrong, okay? C, clarify an abstract point about the development of GDP by mentioning its creator. Um, okay, they do mention their creator, okay? I'm gonna leave that in maybe. But an abstract point about the development, is, is he mentioned to clarify an abstract point? No, okay, so be careful here. That, that looks good if, you look, if you're just rushing at it. But you know, if you keep in your head what you're looking for, let's look at D. Strengthen the argument that the GDP does not adequately measure well-being. Yeah, that's what, the, that's what the Simon said. It doesn't adequately measure well-being. That's our answer. Okay, so that, let's move on. <laughs> um, prominent, most nearly means. Most prominent yardstick. I'm going to use the technique I talked about um, the most prominent yardstick that the media, I'm gonna cover up the choices. Okay, that's the most, most useful, most um, pronounced yardstick, remarkable, recognized, or projecting. It's not a projecting yardstick. We're trying to use a word, uh, most prominent yardstick that the media considers when they try to assess. They're just using it a lot. It's remarkable, no, it's, it's prominent. It's a recognized. Um, it's a recognized yardstick. So we can plug in pronounced yardstick uh, isn't really what we're looking for. We're looking for one that people are using, people are um, acknowledge uh, is useful. First group of initiatives would primarily, let me check the time. Okay. Um, first group of initiatives. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to say what does the first group of initiatives do? What does it do? I'm rephrasing it, I'm going back. First group of initiatives, we had dealing with the downsides of GDP by attempting to fix the indicator itself. Fix the indicator itself. That's what the first initiative is doing. And then I may have to go down here because it, oops, there's clearly some information here in this paragraph because it's about that whole indicator. One key aim of the group of measures is to account for sustainability. It gets kind of dense. Um, for example, that's gonna be a supporting you know, evidence to support that claim. Um, let's have, there's a however, I'm gonna circle that. That's a bottom in a circle. However, they also reflect additional social factors such as household labor and education with a rising value while air pollution and environmental damage lower the score. As a consequence, Downsides of economic growth and modernization ought to be accounted for whilst retaining the benefits, namely, namely a single figure that captures different entities and is comp comparable across nations. So this group wants to find a different measure, okay? They're fixing the indicator itself. Okay, 
trying to fix the, so we know we're looking for, trying to fix the, in, the, in, the indicator itself. Change the measurement A. Change the measurement approach to encompass only social factors. Only is a kind of a, a giveaway here. Um, it, he wants to be, wants to capture everything. It's not exclusively social factors. I'm gonna cross that out. It's extreme, only is extreme. Um, every is extreme. Um, you need to be careful about extreme answers. You wanna really give, give them a, a, a strong check um, if you think that they might be right. Um, take both positive and negative factors into account universally. Um, universally is kind of extreme too, but we do have a balanced thing happening in this answer. I'm gonna leave that in. Show the positive effects of modernization in its new measurements. That's not what I was looking for, right? This is what happens on the reading section. You, if, you, if you give the choices too much of benefit of the doubt, you start doubting yourself, and you need to stick with what you know you're looking for, which is a balanced thing, a single figure that captures different entities and is comparable across nations. They need to reflect additional factors, okay? So there are things here that's, again, this sort of balanced thing we're looking for. Shift the measurement, shift the measurement of GDP so it is calculated per capita. That isn't mentioned. Um, and show the positive effects of modernization. That wasn't mentioned either. It's got to be this. Okay, so a single word can, or a single phrase can disqualify an answer choice. And it's, it's more um, reassuring um, when, you, when you know what you're looking for and you cross out the ones that don't match and you use process of elimination. Okay, um, we're going to move on. I want to take some time to talk about the essay prompt, which is always going to be something along the lines of what we're looking at here. Um, as you read the passage below, consider how the author uses evidence, such as facts or examples, to support claims, reasoning to develop ideas and to connect claims and evidence, or stylistic and persuasive elements such as word choice or appeals to emotion to add power to the ideas expressed. Okay, it's important to note, and then it'll go on to say, after you read the passage, at the end of the passage, there's the assignment, more of the assignment. Write an essay in which you explain how the author builds an argument, how the author builds an argument to persuade his or her audience that something, what the claim is, what the uh, thesis is. In your essay, analyze how the author uses one or more of the features listed above, and that was above, above the passage, or features of your own choice to strengthen the logic and persuasiveness of the argument. And then it adds, your essay should not explain, should not explain whether you agree with the author's claims, okay? Do not write about your opinion. Do not tell us what you think about the author's argument. Okay, you're, you're, you're analyzing the way that the author is using different writerly tools, persuasive elements, to persuade the audience of his or her position. Uh, explain how the author builds an argument to persuade his or her audience. Okay, um, so don't just sum it up. Uh, don't... Um, don't spend your time describing what the author is saying. You're basically trying to select parts of the argument, parts of the passage that, um, that are things that the author is using to build the, uh, build the argument. Um, this, what you're looking at now is another, is the unpacking the essay, the essay prompt. Um, oops, I put two dots there. <laughs> um, sorry about those two dots. Um, so uh, what this will do, this, this is an a, a article that is worth, that is worth looking at. Um, it's called Unpacking the Essay Prompt. And the parts I want to show you are here. Um, this is all, you should read this in your own time after this session is over. It is very useful to kind of understand the do's and don'ts. Um, and what, is the different, what are the different kinds of evidence that the author uses to support claims? Um, that, could be, that could be facts, it could be statistics, it could be quotations from experts, or the author can say that he or she is an expert. 
Um, results, um, results of experiments or other research. Examples. Um, and your job is to figure out what constitutes evidence in a particular passage and how the author uses it to support his or her claims. Okay. You can read this on your own time. Let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, one, um, one more thing I wanted to hit is how to manage your time. This is just one way to manage your time. Um, many people find this effective way to sort of structure the 50 minutes that you have to write the essay. Um, and it goes a little something like this. Uh, we're gonna use SQ3R in a similar way as you used it on the reading passages. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that you read the blurb. Uh, well, it's not, there's no blurb really, but you, you're gonna learn what the title is of the passage from which, of you know, the publication or the, um, the title of this article. And that'll help you contextualize it. And then you can skim the paragraph headings if you feel like you know that that sort of thing helps you, so you should you should practice these things, um, but you should skim and scan, um, and then say to yourself, okay, why am I interested? Why is this interesting? Um, what what am I going to learn here? I'm going to get excited. Let's do this. Then you're going to actively annotate as you go along. Annotation is underlining key underlining claims making the pluses and the minuses and the exclamation points and the question marks. It's looking for statistics. It's looking for um, data. It's looking for the names of you know, people who are um, you know, authorities, whatever it is, the, uh, or studies, you know, people who are authorities in whatever it is that the, that the author is talking about. Um, you're looking for uh, appeals to logic. You're looking for appeals to emotion. What are those? Appeals to logic are things that just make sense. Okay, this, it happened like this, so it must be like that. Like that's uh, using reasoning to, to persuade the audience. If you, uh, it appeals to emotion or, or to your sense of justice or your, you know, makes the reader angry about what the author is writing about, makes the, makes, makes the reader uh, afraid of what might happen if a course of action isn't followed or is followed, those are appeals to emotion. And as you go along, you can, you know, just to make sure that you're still engaged, you can sum up each paragraph in your own words as you go along. What was that about? Okay, got it. Um, that's what reciting is about. So you, you're going to take, you know, seven to ten minutes to read the passage and to annotate it. Then you're going to spend five minutes, three to five minutes, let's say, outlining and making a plan for what each body paragraph is going to say. Um, and one way to do that is to say that, okay, I noticed that the author used a lot of statistics and I'm going to use one body paragraph to talk about the way in which the author uses statistics to build and strengthen the argument. And then another body paragraph may be about the ways that the author uses imagery or uses the, your repetitive rhythm within, within sentences um, or, you know, speaks informally um, to sort of become friends with the reader or, or is it or is the author speaking in a more more elevated um, kind of language that uh, that's more formal um, so you could address those things find examples of those things put them in your body paragraph okay um, and so you're going to write the essay for um, for about 30 minutes um, if it takes 30 35 you know 40 you got to be careful because you definitely want to write a conclusion. You don't, it doesn't look good if you just don't write any conclusion. So you got to write at least one sentence, maybe two for a conclusion. Um, and then you go back and take the last five minutes to, to clean it up a little. Um, maybe you, you, you made a typo, you, you misspelled something, you missed an apostrophe. You know, those things, you know, these, these little details do matter. Um, the read, the people who are reading these essays, um, they, they appreciate legibility. Uh, it's not going to help you if it's difficult for the reader to understand what it is you're trying to say because they have a hard time reading your handwriting. Um, okay, um, so that was the breakneck speed uh, top tips in every single section of the SAT. Um, I may have a couple other things. Yes, I do. Um, lastly, I want to just point you in the direction of 
Tips for Test Day, which is an article in Tips and Strategies section, Khan Academy for Social Safety Practice, um, in which we remind you how important it is to sleep well tonight, tomorrow night, and Friday night. Not just Friday night, try to get at least eight hours of sleep for the next three nights because you really need to start, you know, you need to recharge your batteries and make it, make it a priority to be energized and be, you know, well nourished on test day. I, there are a couple of uh, questions that have come in that I'm now going to see whether I can quickly answer. Um, should we read the whole passage during the reading section or just skim it? That's, that's a great question. Different things work for different people. Um, you may find that it, it, it's better for you to just read the whole passage first. And uh, many people find that they like to just skim it and then read the questions and then go back. I've worked with a lot of students over the years. I, I find that more people, it, de it depends on your reading pace. It depends on whether you run out of time at the end of a section. Um, and if the answer is no, you don't run out of time, I would say read the whole thing. You could, uh, if you skim it, it, it all depends on how effective a skimmer you are, how fluent you are as a skimmer. Um, and so if you're, if you feel like you understand the main idea of, qu of questions, I'm sorry, the main idea of paragraphs um, just by skimming, then go ahead and skim. Um, but if you find that skimming gets you nowhere, which I've found with a lot of students I've worked with, um, then plan to read the whole thing and plan to read it actively, as I um, sort of indicated earlier in the session. Um, uh, for the essay, uh, is longer better? And is there a minimum number of paragraphs we should write? Um, the answer is no, longer isn't better, but uh, Ancillary to that is that short, really short is not good. <laughs> so you, you definitely want a clear introduction. You definitely want a clear conclusion. You want to have those be separate paragraphs. Um, and, and two body paragraphs is what you should be aiming for. One big, long, center, um, main body paragraph. I'm guessing it, it, you know, you should, you'd be able to subdivide that idea into different, into different paragraphs. Um, so I would not say there's a strict minimum, but I would recommend you know three to four paragraphs total, and longer is fine too. Um, don't repeat yourself. Um, if make have each paragraph say one specific thing, and support that claim in your topic sentence with evidence that backs it up. Uh, okay, let's see. How should I manage my time during the reading section? How do we quickly implement SQ3R strategies when we don't have a lot of time per passage? Great question. It requires some practice. Um, you, SQ3R is really just a, it's just a way to frame active reading. Um, I would argue that with a little bit of practice, you can, you can underline important words and add little pluses and minuses and question marks and exclamation points. And that is an effect, that in itself is an effective reading strategy that doesn't take any time. I'm not, I'm not suggesting um, that you write full sentences in the margins um, because I know that takes time. Um, if you find yourself running out of time again and again, one thing you can do from a time management perspective is to skip those questions that you look at and you, you really can't make sense of. It's like a two or three part question. or um, You can skip those questions. You wanna make sure to get to every question in the reading section because there are some easier questions waiting for you at the end. The last passage is not the most difficult passage. So, I mean, it could be, but it usually isn't, you know. The, so there are easier questions waiting for you at the end. Don't get hung up on harder questions earlier in a section um, if it means you're gonna run out of time um, before you have a chance to look at those questions that might be easier for you. We're coming up to our hour. I don't wanna keep you guys any longer. So come on, visit, you know, visit often. Uh, thanks for coming. It was, it was a pleasure to help you, and I hope you found it helpful. Um, and, and leave comments. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if there's something that I missed. And we will, um, the folks standing by at the College Board, folks standing by at Khan Academy, and myself will, will be glad to respond to your comments and, um, and help you out in any way we can. But, uh, but get back on to uh, SAT practice on Khan Academy. Do your best. And, um, and thanks for coming. You're going to do great. <laughs>